Hi everybody, Sandra Ankrum with Indivisible Northern Kentucky District 4. Welcome to another edition of Coffee Clatch Conversations with Candidates. This is a Q&A session where you get to know your candidates because we're going to ask some questions. If you're watching live right now, please feel free to send in questions to us. We will get them to your candidates so you um, can participate as well. Today's guest is Matt Kaufman. He's from District, District 26. He's running for the Senate um, seat there. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. Why Thank don't you, you um, go ahead and give us a little bit of background about yourself and why you're running for office. Absolutely. So I am an educator first and foremost. All of my education that's been higher has happened here in Kentucky. I got my undergraduate from Bellarmine University with a major in English and a minor in psych master's degree in English, master's degree in teaching, and this this past year I got my educational specialist degree which certifies me to be a superintendent of schools all the way down to any kind of administrative position. So my heart is in education. I believe all problems in our society can be fixed with education and we need to fund education. So I've been teaching now for 11 years. I grew up as a teacher at Oldham County High School for my first seven years teaching. I helped resurrect a literary magazine there called Spectrum, which actually won all kinds of awards uh, for the nation with NCTE. And cool. so my job there was to build writers, build artists, and our mission, which carried over to my next school, was to use the arts as a vehicle for personal and social transformation. I was looking for a new challenge after seven years, and it got to the point in Oldham County, as a teacher, I was struggling to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. I was also a rank one teacher at that point in time. So I applied to JCPS, I got an immediate $10,000 raise in one year hmm. because they have a union. <laughs> and, and with that, I went to a new school, it's called the Mary N. Seymour School, and I'm part of that school now and I love it. Uh, I do a literary magazine there, it's called The Canon, the idea that our voices are canons and we're booming on the scene, they've got authority, and the canon works like the best of our best that are there, but all voices are included. And what I find is kids need to enter the conversation wherever they're at conversation of the human condition, conversation and things in life, and, and the arts is a great way to do that. And they transform on stage and they become bigger parts of our communities. Barack Obama is the best president of my lifetime. As an English teacher, I loved teaching his speeches, his rhetoric, mm -hmm. how I viewed him as educator in chief. Uh, I thought he made complex things simple. And too often mm -hmm. nowadays, politicians can make simple things complex. Uh, in teaching where I teach right now at the Marion Seymour School, we've got kids from 44 countries at our school. Mm -hmm. When Trump rose to power in the campaign, uh, things changed for some of my students. Uh, we've got a Muslim population there, and girls who are walking home wearing hijabs or having slurs thrown at them on the walk home. Mm -hmm. Mexican students who were born on American soil, but their parents are immigrants, all of a sudden have chance of build the wall around them mm -hmm. as they're walking at the mall. Mm -hmm. So the xenophobia and the racism that began to thrive in our culture under the rise of Trump uh, really caused me to be more politically active. Mm -hmm. Now, I did want to give him the benefit of the doubt when he first started. And that benefit of the doubt was see who he elects to his cabinet. Mm -hmm. When I saw Scott Pruitt was elected as the EPA director and who is who does not believe in climate change. Mm -hmm. And I saw the rise of Steve Bannon and Betsy DeVos. Uh, that was his chance. And ever since then, it's been very destructive. Um, so we started a group called Cultural Dialoguers. Mm -hmm. So our kids who were facing any kind of racism, any kind of xenophobia, we needed to give them a place to talk about the issues that was happening to them, mm -hmm. uh, a safe place where we could celebrate their diversity uh, in a place where we could create bridges of understanding between cultures and to work for social justice. And so in that group, we stood up for kindness and we stood up against bullying in all its forms. I view schools as a microcosm of society. Mm -hmm. Schools don't take place in a vacuum. What happens outside of school influences what happens inside of school. So if we were teaching kids how to work through these issues inside of school, they could better handle them when they go outside. We're trying to prepare tomorrow's leaders, to give them the thinking strategies, to break down barriers, to learn to talk to and listen to people who disagree with you, mm -hmm. and to make the, the goal of the conversation, not to win the argument, but to understand the other person, to find common ground and make truth your aim. So we try to root all of our conversations in facts, in reason, and compassion. Mm -hmm. 
And so we built that group. And the more we got involved with our work, people from U of L, uh, an international film director, Ben Friedman, found us, and they wanted to get involved with us. Uh -huh. And we saw that there are so many good people right now in Kentucky and around that want to be a part of progress, that want to create bridges, that that want our democracy to work for all of us, mm -hmm. and that. In fact, the, a lot of the hate that my kids were experiencing, that wasn't the majority of people. Right, right. The majority of people respect them. Mm -hmm. They respect their heritage. Mm -hmm. They want people to be happy and to be safe. Right. Um, and so as, as things progressed, you know, I, I continued my political activism, mm -hmm. which was just showing up to rallies, mm -hmm. was staying informed, uh, and, and really just in my sphere of influence, the three feet around me, just be a vehicle for kindness and wisdom and listening, uh, try to uplift every single person I can. Mm -hmm. uh, in education, you can always do more and you can always do better, and I, I feel that every single day waking up knowing that you know my, my students are depending on me, my colleagues are depending mm -hmm. on me, and my principal is depending on me. When this year started, Save Our Schools reached out to me. Uh -huh. And it, it's a wonderful organization, uh, and, and they've really created this movement to, to bring educators mm -hmm. and our allies into the political process. Mm -hmm. I think our major enemy, and this is all of us, our major enemy is apathy. Right. When, when people feel disconnected mm -hmm. from their government, mm -hmm. disconnected from their democracy, and they feel like their vote doesn't matter, right. and like you're getting this hailstorm of just bad things happening at you, mm -hmm. how can you pick something and focus on it and try to make a difference? Mm -hmm. um, Save Our Schools got me involved in this, and being having a positive place to channel my energy mm -hmm. uh, and, and to work for change has been transformative for me and for everybody who's helped me on this campaign. My campaign is run by mostly past students from mm -hmm. Oldham County High School. Mm -hmm. um, Lynn Ward is the, the mother of Kelly Ward. So their parents are also helping mm -hmm. out. That's and great. and, and <laughs> her home is home base right now. Uh -huh. So we've got like 400 signs there. Wow. <laughs> we've got our literature there. We've got our t-shirts there, our bumper stickers. So mm -hmm. it's just like, and other teachers from Wilton County are helping out. And now with this this educator movement, I mm -hmm. think it's the year of the educator right now. Right, right. Uh, with this educator movement, more teachers are coming involved. Yep. And, and, and I think, you know, as an educator, our, our goal is we face apathy in schools, mm -hmm. you know, and so our goal is to engage every single kid in the seat. Mm -hmm. I think as a legislator, you need to engage every single citizen. You need to make a concrete effort to, to reach out to mm -hmm. them, listen to them, and get their voice. Right. And I'm not going to pretend to be everybody's voice. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Uh, what I will do is I have a listen first approach mm -hmm. and I want to give a platform for other people's voices. And I want everybody to see me learn from people mm -hmm. and talk with people and think with people. We all need a seat at the table. All of us need to be heard. I think the quality of our conversation is often the quality of our community. Mm -hmm. And we're facing all these issues right now with, with poverty, with, with climate change, with our pension crisis mm -hmm. for educators. Mm -hmm. The list goes on and on and on. And what I'm telling everybody that's helping me with my campaign and the attitude that I have and what I tell my students, all this stuff might not be our fault, mm -hmm. but it's our responsibility to fix right, it. Right. Great. Okay, that's great. That's very inspirational. Wow. Um, so we're going to jump right into pensions because that is yeah. a hot topic and obviously you're very affected by this because Absolutely. you're a teacher. So, you know, what are your thoughts on this pension issue, especially what the governor is proposing and kind of what happened in Frankfurt um, where they snuck in this bill at the last second and um, yeah. why don't you give um, your thoughts on so, that? So, I don't think fondly of the governor. <laughs> um, he, he emailed JCPS and I think other school districts before he got elected saying he would take care of the pension problem. He is the only legislator to ever directly email on my school email. Hmm. That struck me as odd. Um, this year, he called JCPS, the district I work for, an unmitigated disaster. And he said that without ever setting foot in hmm. one of our schools. So in education, I mean, we believe in being data-driven mm -hmm. and being research-driven mm -hmm. and transparency of process and product of bringing all stakeholders to the table. We make truth our goal. Right. Um, and, and we try to get rid of all logical fallacies. Mm -hmm. and, and we're comfortable admitting our ignorance, you know, and having other people fill in our gaps and building a community. 
he hasn't shown that process. It, it's all been very, very secretive. Right. Uh, so he never did come to our school. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would love to talk with Governor Bevan and invite him into my classroom and see what kind of discussions we have. We've been a very engaged student populace. Mm -hmm. That said, everybody knows he's called us thugs. He's called us selfish. Right. He's called us all kinds of things. Um, and then in the sewer bill, which right. I thought was a really interesting metaphor, yeah. uh, they, they passed this, this budget which is going to be cutting our pensions mm -hmm. and cutting our health benefits. Mm -hmm. So educators, that is affecting our livelihoods. Mm -hmm. um, nobody expects to get rich off a pension. No. Uh, as, as an educator, I put 13% of my paycheck into this pension mm -hmm. program. And so we've done our part. Right. And, and we're wondering why the government hasn't done theirs. Mm -hmm. and, and they try to cloud the issue. And mm -hmm. they try to scapegoat us. Yeah. But educators right now, we are mission-driven people, we are passionate people, we, we are service-oriented. Uh, you get into teaching for multiple reasons. I got in because I love my discipline. Mm -hmm. I love to read and write, I love to think, I love to build communities to talk about issues. And I also love particularly the high school age. Because <laughs> in a high school age, your identity isn't set. So much can go wrong, so much can go right. And, and their their identity is being formed, mm -hmm. and and I just I just love working with that group because they're so passionate, also, mm -hmm. especially about social issues. Uh, so I was at the rally this past Monday, mm -hmm. and I'm very inspired right now. I'm very optimistic. That's good. I, I think educators are are working together. Mm -hmm. We have this group 120 mm -hmm. United, which is all 120 counties, mm -hmm. and it's a grassroots movement. And yes, we're standing up for our pensions. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're standing up for our health care. There are some teachers that this bill goes through, they're 60 years old, and they'll be kicked off their health care. So, so what are they going to do then for that right. next five years? They have an $800 bill a month all of a sudden for health care. Right. This is going to bankrupt some people. Yeah. And we can do better mm -hmm. as, a, as a state and as a country than if you get sick, you go bankrupt. Right. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. So would you, how would you, um, how would you work to fund the pensions? I, I mean, I think that's the big issue here that sure. the governor is, um, you so know, we need, talking about. We definitely about, need to so. fund those pensions. Yes. I mean, I've got ideas for that. But I also want to say just two more yep, things on the pension, on uh -huh. the education. So we're not just standing up for our pensions mm -hmm. and our health care, but mm -hmm. we're standing up for the institution of education itself. Mm -hmm. That I believe education is one of the great sources of equity mm -hmm. in our culture, mm -hmm. and it's an equalizer. It gives. When it's done right and it builds community, it empowers kids and their families, mm -hmm. if done right, to really help carve their way in the world and be a support for them. I think school can be a hub of community and it should be. Mm -hmm. We have to invest in it, not right. defund it. Right. It's a lack of leadership when all you do is cut funding right. to solve the pension crisis. Right. We can raise revenue. We're going to get to that. Okay. Uh, and I also think we're standing up for our kids. Mm -hmm. And we're standing up for young teachers coming in, yeah. you know. So the, these individuals who say, we'll take care of you now. Mm -hmm. But those new teachers coming in, they don't need that. No, we're fighting for our students. We're fighting for our schools. We're fighting for our profession. We're, we're fighting for the common good. And that's what we know. Mm -hmm. This is what we love to do. Right. Uh, that said, how are we going to fund it? Well, somehow they funded a massive tax break for millionaires. Yeah. On the backs of educators. Mm -hmm. So that's up. Mm -hmm. So we, we find funding for these tax cuts, but we can't find funding for education. Mm -hmm. I question that. Right. Um, there's a few revenue raising ideas I have. I believe Kentucky can be the leader of the nation in hemp, mm -hmm. that we can grow hemp, that we can use hemp to manufacture biodegradable plastics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and even get our schools working with the, these new kind of companies that ori originate where our schools, our students are going there, they're making these biodegradable plastics, mm -hmm. making products mm -hmm. out of them. You can make paper out of it, clothing. It's right. a wonderful, wonderful plant. We can stop cutting down rainforests. Yeah. We can become the leaders in the nation. We can put our farmers to work. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our coal workers are being hurt right now. Really bad. We need to find work for them. Right. And they, they need to be involved in that process. Yes. We can't dictate to them, you know, what they'll be doing next. Nobody wants to be 45 years old and be retraining the job all right. of a sudden and being dictated to. So they have to become part of the solution. But our coal workers helped build the economy and the energy that allowed us to get where we are right now. Right. We have to honor that. We have to respect their heritage. Uh, 
And we also have to work with them to find out what's next. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer they can they can lead in farming hemp. They can mm -hmm. help with all kinds of manufacturing jobs mm -hmm. with hemp. Uh, I think it's wrong to deny people medical marijuana, mm -hmm. that we need to get on that train. Uh, I know many people that are dealing with chronic pain right mm -hmm. now, and the medicine they are forced to take is causing horrible side effects, right. and they don't want to take it. Right. Or addiction, and we'll talk about that. We know the pharmaceutical company has contributed a lot mm -hmm. to the opiate crisis that we are facing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's wrong to deny people medical marijuana. It's medicine, they need it, and it's also a revenue stream. Right. Mm -hmm. I think we can look and grow local business in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. I want to incentivize alternative energy, give mm -hmm. businesses and give homes tax cuts mm -hmm. if they're using alternative energy, whether it's solar panels or geothermal. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to link our schools to nonprofits and local businesses and put our students to work in meaningful and relevant ways mm -hmm. where they're gaining the skills they're going to need in the workplace mm -hmm. to become the leaders that we need them to be. We're seeing our youth right now with the students at Parkland and all across the country with March for Our Lives. It happened two weekends ago. They're ready to be engaged. They're ready to go to work. Mm -hmm. They need a sense of direction, mm -hmm. and they're entering the conversation where they're at. Right. So we need to meet them where they're at. We need to offer them all kinds of possible alternatives of how they can plug in their energy and how they can get involved and how they can really grow their future for our state, for themselves, for our country. Mm -hmm. For me, that's our responsibility to do. Gambling is also something mm -hmm. we could legalize. Mm -hmm. uh, when the floods hit, how long was that flood? A month and a half ago? Yeah. One of the casinos closed down during the flood, and that casino lost $250 million a day oh. Oh in taxes. God. So I know a lot of Kentuckians go over to Indiana and spend mm -hmm. their money. Uh, let's keep that money here. Right. You know, I, I think that could also grow our tourism industry. Mm -hmm. And we also need to look at ways that generate wealth in the long term. Mm -hmm. You know, real wealth. So. I wonder if we can make affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder how alternative energy, I wonder how these other in hemp, mm -hmm. medical marijuana, these other industries we develop that don't just give us a cash inflow, mm -hmm. but actually raise the wealth of our community. Because right. there's more to wealth than just money. It's right, quality right. of life, it's happiness, it's community, right. all yep. of these things. Yep. Very good. Um, OK, so let's talk about um, Governor Bevan's budget. Mm -hmm because this would cut funds to public education. Um, right. And it also gives, um, House Bill 134 would give tax credits for private school tuition, and this would take away from our public school tax money. So what are your ideas? Um, we kind of talked about this a little bit. What are your thoughts about charter schools, um, the governor's budget towards public schools, and how would you, if you were elected, what would you do to change these things? Well, I went to private school for elementary school and for high school. Hmm. Bellarmine is also a private school. Mm -hmm. All three of my graduate degrees are from public school with U of L. Mm -hmm. That said, I've worked in public schools my, my whole adult career. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's again, like, it's the great equalizer in our democracy. It creates equity. If we give vouchers to private schools, that's going to create more inequity in our culture, mm -hmm. where kids who are already on the margins are going to be in danger of being totally pushed off the page. Right. And so I am, I'm scared mm -hmm. for that. And I fight for these kids. As a teacher, you learn to view the world through your, the lens of your students mm -hmm. and their lives. So when I see these policies, I think of those kids who are already on the margins, who are, are working full time already in their lives right. as like juniors in high school mm -hmm. to pay bills mm -hmm. at their house because otherwise they won't meet the bills. Right. And, and they're working full time and they're in sports and they're in school. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so much. And so when we're talking about these funding, these vouchers for private schools, that's taking away money from kids who need it for our public schools. Right. It, it's, it's threatening our public education for the sake of private school those kids already have so much. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's other institutions that can donate money mm -hmm. towards them. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as charter schools, I'm a big fan of charter schools as long as they are privately funded. Mm -hmm. They cannot take funds that are meant for public schools. And it's the same logic. Those kids who are already on the margins or be in danger of being pushed off the page. Mm -hmm. And in charter schools, they pick the students they want. Right. Teachers aren't held to the same standards as far as their education and what they do in the classroom, mm -hmm. not held to the same transparency standards. 
So you're getting a lower form of education for profit. Right. So for me, education is not a for profit model. It's a it's a service oriented industry. Mm -hmm. And our goal our goal is to help every kid be the best possible version of themselves, to help them find their passion and then they'll find their purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm also a believer that we need to get rid of our testing culture. Mm -hmm. Private schools and charter schools don't have that. Right. Public schools do. Right. So we have this extra bureaucracy that's put in. Well, why can't we make public schools more like these charter schools that are so great? Mm -hmm. Let's do away with the testing culture. Mm -hmm. Get rid of that. Nobody cares about your test scores after you graduate high school. Right. Nobody asks me about my K prep test. <laughs> uh, but they do care huh. about the quality of your work and yes. the quality of your character. Mm -hmm. So we need to redo how we do school. Mm -hmm. And JCPS is doing that. We're diving into deeper learning. Mm -hmm. At Oldham County, I saw us doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, So our schools are doing great things and we're being misrepresented by our legislators, being called selfish, being right. called lazy. Mm -hmm. Steve Meredith went and said that we couldn't really do our jobs in his tweet and that 40% yeah. of Kentucky graduates can't read and do yeah. math. That's terrible. <laughs> no, he doesn't know how to research. Right. I don't know how he got there. Yeah. Uh, but. But, but with that, educators, we do know how to do our research. Mm -hmm. And so we're an engaged populace right mm -hmm. now. Right. We, we are politically motivated. Mm -hmm. And we didn't plan to become legislators. Right. <laughs> uh, but we feel like at this point, we have to. Right. Because if we're going to have someone protect our schools, mm -hmm. protect our kids, protect working families, and protect our environment, mm -hmm. we need to stand up. Right. And, and we have a history in community organizing. And so we want to organize the community, give all people a seat at the table, mm -hmm. and really move forward. That's great. Okay, so let's talk about higher education costs sure. because they are skyrocketing. Absolutely. You know, the average college student ends up tens of thousands of dollars in debt upon graduating from college. Do you have any solutions for this crisis, and how can the Kentucky government support our students in their pursuit of higher education? Well, I, I definitely also I feel that pain. Uh, <laughs> as a teacher, I know what it's like to live month to month, right. you know, and not be able to make ends meet sometimes. Uh, I still, I'm still paying off my student loans. Right. It takes 10, you know, 10, 15, I'll be paying them off for a while, yeah. uh -huh. you know, but in my mind it's the best loan you'll ever get because they can't take back your education. Right. Once you got it, you can get it. And I've, I've had great schooling experiences. Mm -hmm. That said, I've got a lot of really bright students right now who are worried about paying for college. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to take a couple years off. Yeah. You have to afford a car first. Right. Be able to get an apartment first, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, be more independent before they go to college. Uh, I've got students who have already graduated mm -hmm. and who couldn't afford to stay in college yeah. and were forced to drop out. So we do public education, kindergarten through 12th grade. I'm a believer that we also need public education. We need pre-K. Mm -hmm. I, th I think we need much more affordable daycare mm -hmm. for for those first three years of life. I mean, language development, cognitive development, emotional and social development, those first four years uh, affects kids exponentially throughout life. Right. And our daycare workers don't get paid enough. Mm -mm. Uh, they're getting minimum wage jobs. That should be a job and a profession that we elevate mm -hmm. and really work on those kids' language skills and emotional skills. And that's gonna pay dividends down the road for the rest of their schooling, for our commonwealth, for our jobs industry, we need to start thinking seven generations ahead. Mm -hmm. And as we start doing that, we're gonna start seeing actual wealth. Not these short-term financial gains, mm -hmm. but actual wealth. Mm -hmm. That said, I think community college. Mm -hmm. We do, again, public, K through 12. Why can't we fund community college also? It seems to me we can find a way to do that. Mm -hmm. If we put our priorities in the right it, spot, right? If we find common ground, like, here's a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, kids need to do X, Y, and Z to get a job and, and, and whatever. What are some solutions we can come with? We, we can generate revenue. Right. right. We can grow our schools. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we talked about minimum wage. Um, right. Senate Bill 17, 17 would increase the minimum wage for many workers to $10 per hour by 2020. Do you support this? And do you think that's even enough? to ten dollars an hour well i think fifteen dollars an hour is a living wage uh, i support that because it's a step in the right direction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely but nobody should be working over 40 hours a week and still live in poverty mm -hmm. and not be able to pay your bills there's several injustices that happen in our society you get sick i've, I've known friends who have gotten sick 
and they've lost their house because of it. Right. They've gotten sick, they've lost their job because of it. Mm -hmm. They've gotten sick and they've gone bankrupt because of it. Mm -hmm. One of my really good friends, who was a mentor of mine, he was born in Canada, but he taught in Texas for a good while, he's taught in Kentucky for a good while, he was a teacher at over to Oldham County. He's a mentor, I'm a better man, I'm a better teacher because of his influence in my life. He's been done wrong so often by the health insurance industries and by being rushed out of hospitals mm -hmm. and places right. that his only thing he can do right now is move away from his grandkids, away from his kids, away from the community he has here to go back to Canada to get health care for him and his wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that's an injustice. That's right. mm -hmm. So it, it, we love freedom, we love security, all these things, but I would say if you, you are working full time mm -hmm. and you are not being able to make ends meet, that's not freedom. Right. You know, a family value would be you work full time and you're able to, to live. A family value would be if I get sick, I'm not in danger of losing my job mm -hmm. or my house. Right. A, a family value would allow me to work full time and have the security that if I do get sick, I'll be taken care of, mm -hmm. that I'm paying into that with my taxes, right. uh, that I get some time with my family, that I am seen as a person and not just something on the profit margin of an insurance company. Right, right. So does that mean you support single payer or something similar to that? Well, I love Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Medicare for all would be what I would advocate for. Mm -hmm. uh, in do, you, my... do you think we could do that here in Kentucky? Um, not on a national level, because I don't know if that's going to happen, but uh, there's other states that have done similar things. I would advocate for it. Mm -hmm. And so, again, as, so, as an educator, I know I've got gaps. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to be really comfortable admitting my ignorance on things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be very, very loud in saying that we do need Medicare for all, that it's a certain kind of terrorism in our culture, that if you get sick, mm -hmm. you're only going to get help if you can afford it. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that we can treat everybody, mm -hmm. that if we say we have the best health care system around, that includes all of us, not just if you have the money. Right. Uh, so that said, I'll be a uh, an advocate for Medicare for All, and I'm going to align myself with experts who understand these issues much better than me, right, right. and I'm going to learn from them, I'm going to internalize that, I'm going to have them check my rhetoric and check my thoughts until I become an expert in the policy myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I'm going to be looking for the community, the commonwealth, mm -hmm. to add, add, add to my, my knowledge on that. Right, right. Um, so back to the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. um, my question, there's multiple far, uh, factors involved. Big pharma, physicians overprescribing, the need for alternative pain meds. Yeah. What are your thoughts and ideas for combating this epidemic in Kentucky? Well, first off, we need more treatment centers. And I've seen legislation that's cutting treatment centers. Mm -hmm. And when it's easier to get high than get treatment, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna have more addicts. Uh, I also believe Big Pharma plays a very, very heavy role in the opiate crisis mm -hmm. we have now, and they should be held accountable, and we should be able to take a lawsuit to them and get reimbursed for it and use that funds to open up more treatment facilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to see addiction not as some character flaw or, or some legal thing where we'll be locking people up, but it is a health issue, mm -hmm. and, and we get them the help they need. Right. Uh, I do believe to stop the spread of disease, we need needle exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do believe we need to offer other kinds of treatments for people dealing with chronic pain. Right. Anybody who's been in chronic pain knows it can be all-consuming. Yeah. And I do think medical marijuana is something that we can use to treat that chronic mm -hmm. pain, which will also raise revenue for us, mm -hmm. will also protect people from becoming addicted to narcotics. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so some of the uh, unemployment numbers in Kentucky is due to lack of skilled workers. And so we talked mm. about this a little bit. Um, and here in northern Kentucky, our economy is booming. How do we ensure that we have enough skilled workers in this area to support our growing economy? So my lens coming into this is from an educator's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. With that, I, you know, I'm an English teacher. But I've also built intergenerational, interdisciplinary communities that we're all working on things that are bigger than us, mm -hmm. and it's a massive collaborative thing. And I've seen kids get real skill sets for mm -hmm. stuff. It's amazing. Uh, I think schools should be the hub of community. 
So we need to link our schools to nonprofits, to local businesses, to local industry, to alternative energy, to research, things like that. We need to be in constant conversation with what I would say is our community partners, our mm -hmm. common wealth. Mm -hmm. And what skills do you need there mm -hmm. for these kids to become and get a job here? What dispositions do you need? And we need more apprenticeships mm -hmm. with these businesses, with these nonprofits and our students to give them more direct pathways. School has to be meaningful, it has to be relevant. I think we've done school the same way for a long time, mm -hmm. and we are beyond the sit and get. Mm -hmm. Kids need to be engaged in what they're doing, and as they're doing that, they'll find more purpose, they'll find more passion, they'll, they'll build those skill sets, and they'll become the leaders we need. They'll be building the alternative energy we need. Mm -hmm. They'll learn how to treat the elderly who are too often abandoned mm -hmm. uh, in, in various nursing homes. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll learn to become healers in hospitals. They'll learn how to build cars. They'll learn how to, to grow uh, a plant like hemp and take it from that plant to a plastic product mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's good for the environment and that's good for our, the economy and good for our learning. Mm -hmm. We need them building things, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not just spitting information out on a test. Right. So what about um, workers who are older? And we talked a little bit about this Absolutely. earlier, but what, what about for them? I mean, because they can't really go back to these, to the high schools and get retrained. So how do we, how do we retrain workers? Uh, so we have these skilled workers that we need here to try to draw some of these you know, companies here. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to go back to schools again. Like too often, a school building mm -hmm. is just empty at night when we've got mm -hmm. classrooms that are available for use. We can bring in uh, people to ter teach computer skills. Mm -hmm. We can bring in people to teach language skills, presentation skills, a wide variety of things. We can assess the needs of our businesses, our nonprofits, our communities, bring in people to work with these parents, mm -hmm. uh, these community members, and usher them forward. Mm -hmm. that, that would be great, I think. Um, our public libraries could also be a good vehicle for that. Right, right. I mean, there's, there's lots of institutions that are tapped in to people in the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. and they're struggling, and they need resources. Right, right. So as a legislator, you have to have your pulse in the community. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have that mm -hmm. because in public school you teach everybody. Right. Every religion, right. every race, every economic class, yep. everybody. And so we need to be listening to those individuals, their struggles. Mm -hmm. We need to be listening to well, and their successes mm -hmm. and businesses and their struggles and successes. And we can be the bridge. Mm -hmm. We can be the connector. Schools are already connected to students and their families and their communities. Mm -hmm. I think we need more outreach. Mm -hmm. I'd use public libraries also. Mm -hmm. I would invest in institutions uh, that raise the knowledge for all of us. Great. Okay, so what about right to work? So we've adopted right to work here in Kentucky. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And if you're elected, what would you do about it? So something really bothers me uh, beyond right to work, and it's just even the labeling of right to work, where we label these policies in a way where they sound really positive, mm -hmm. right. right? Like I, 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 you know, I believe part of like, you know, a good country is that you know I can find a good job mm -hmm. if I build my skills, I do the right things, I can get a good job. I want a right to work, right? right? <laughs> uh, but that's not what right to work is. Right. Right. Right to work is just union busting. Yeah. And it, it's hurting people's ability to organize together mm -hmm. and, and to create equity and level the playing field. Mm -hmm. We need to repeal and get rid of right to work. It is wrong for Kentucky. Mm -hmm. it, it's wrong for every state. And we were promised it would bring in so much business and other industry. Mm -hmm. It hasn't done that. Mm -hmm. But it has enabled our workers to be getting taken advantage of, yeah. get less sick days, get less vacation time, mm -hmm. and to put people, again, who are already on the margins from being pushed off the page. Mm -hmm. So, so many people that you see fighting right now for our democracy, that's educators, that's union workers, mm -hmm. that's working class families, they're taking on the second, maybe some of them their third or fourth job right. to become more of an activist mm -hmm. and engage in our democracy. Because we realized that if we won't work for our democracy, it won't work for us. Right. That we have to become the leaders in it and be the change we need mm -hmm. for it to actually work for us. Yep. Okay, so let's talk about House Bill um, 366. Okay. This is the tax, the tax reform um, that's going through right now, and it's a huge tax cut for the wealthiest right. uh, Kentuckians. Right. Um, and then it's going to raise taxes on, um, you know, the poor people, basically. Yeah. So, um, what do you think about this? And what are your um, 
ideas to counteract counteract this. What would be some other some of your ideas on raising revenue through taxes? Um, not this obviously this bill. Right, though. right. So that that bill is going to hurt me. That bill is going to hurt the families that I'm connected to and I serve. Uh, I'm absolutely against that bill. It, it's the trickle down philosophy. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you cut the taxes on the top earners, and somehow that wealth trickles all the way down. That has not happened ever. It's been proven <laughs> false. What has been proven true is that if you grow the working class and you go grow the middle class, that a rising tide lifts all boats, mm -hmm. and that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. So for that again, that's invest in education. That's mm -hmm. investing in local industry, those kinds of things. Uh, I would cut corporate tax loopholes. Mm -hmm. We lose a lot of money in that. Uh, this corporate welfare has not been good for Kentucky. It's not right. been good for working families. It's allowed to, the rich to get exponentially richer. We live in a time right now where we are the wealthiest country to have ever existed. Yet not everybody feels that. Right, right. Folks live paycheck to paycheck. They're scared to get sick. They're scared if their car breaks down. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have those concerns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we're working full time, we should be able to meet our basic needs. Right, absolutely. So do you have some other ideas on um, raising revenue? We talked about this a little bit, but sure. what um, there was a House Bill 29, and it was a comprehensive tax modernization bill, um, and it wanted to um, reinstate the estate sales tax, raise tax on cigarettes, expand sales tax to luxury services, close the cor uh, corporate loopholes, and add an earned income credit. So are those the types of... Um, you know, taxes that you would support where it was more fair, um, it's not targeting a certain group. Did you say services are being taxed? Uh, luxury services. So I think that was more like. Um, I wonder how they define luxury services. I think it was more like um, yachts. Uh, oh, you know, I'm fine those, with that. you know, absolutely. <laughs> those absolutely. types of things that saying, not a lot of us have. When, when, <laughs> when you tax the service industry, uh -huh. though, you're taxing working families mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're hurting those jobs. But luxury services. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll be fine for that. The cigarette tax, I think, is a great it's, idea. Something else I would like to implement. Mm -hmm. and what you see uh, across the country is that when you when you put a cigarette tax in, uh, you'll get an immediate bump in mm -hmm. revenue, mm -hmm. and then over time it goes down, which means people are smoking cigarettes less. Right. You know, we're not taking we we're not taking away their right to smoke cigarettes, right. mm -hmm. but we are going to tax it a little bit more. That gives us that needed revenue, mm -hmm. uh, and it does even out over time. Right. Okay, so House Bill 372 was an anti-marriage equality bill, and it would allow social service and housing discrimination against same-sex married couples. If you are elected, what would you do to ensure that Kentucky does not discriminate against anyone, regardless of race, religion, or sexual orientation? I would fight to repeal that bill immediately. Uh, so again, I don't know if it passed, but okay. I know it was introduced. At, and at, so, yeah, as an educator, know. I work with everybody. Yeah. And so I, I've taught, you know, many kids from the LGBTQ community, and that's wrong. It's, it's wrong in Kentucky right now. In many places in Kentucky, mm -hmm. you can get fired for being part of that community. Mm -hmm. You can also lose your house if, if the one person leasing it to you doesn't want you there. Right. That kind of discrimination is wrong. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. already fought the civil rights yeah. battle, but mm -hmm. we are still fighting it. And so we always need to be on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. And the right side of history is simple as this. Let's do right by people and do right by the planet. If we're doing those two things, mm -hmm. we're doing good. Yep, that sounds great. Um, so, reproductive rights. Many mm -hmm. bills are being presented in the legislature right now that will limit women's reproductive health rights. We feel that we are under attack. Um, what is your stance on women, a woman's right to choose what is best for her reproductive health? Um, and here in Northern Kentucky, I don't know if you have St. Elizabeth down in Oldham County, but it's a it's a health system up here that's taking over everything basically. Um, but they won't perform certain procedures such as tubal ligation due to their religious beliefs. So what would you do um, to kind of counteract that as well? Because we feel like, you know, our our health um, reproductive health rights are being under attack by some of these bills that are being introduced. Absolutely. So um, if forced to vote in this issue, I, I vote pro-choice every single time. Mm -hmm. That nobody understands that choice and the magnitude of it better than the woman who's forced to make that decision. I think another part of the problem with this, though, is the same thing with right to work. Mm -hmm. That our views, the, the views for pro-choice, it's being mischaracterized. Mm -hmm. Nobody was pro-abortion. Right. Nobody is like, let's go abort babies. Right. Uh, you know, and so institutions like Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. are under attack. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and people are saying that our tax dollars are funding these mass abortions and there's all this misinformation about mm -hmm. there about that and it's just not true mm -hmm. we need to get better about our messaging in fact the more Planned Parenthoods we have the less abortions we have right. <laughs> you know so to, to really be pro-life mm -hmm. I would think you would want more Planned Parenthoods mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you would want more resources well we're not just teaching abstinence in schools for sex ed right. that we're actually talking about this much earlier in education mm -hmm. getting kids comfortable talking about this stuff because we see education works mm -hmm. in preventing unwanted pregnancies mm -hmm. and preventing STDs those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So we need to have an education front with this. We need to protect Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. And it's just flat out wrong when you have a bunch of older men <laughs> around a table mm -hmm. litigating how a woman can or cannot use her body. Mm -hmm. uh, women need a seat at the table mm -hmm. and they're starting to get that. And, and we need them there. All of us need them there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Okay, so House Bill 227 is an anti-solar bill. Um, it would reward monopoly utility companies and punish consumers. If passed, it would put rooftop solar out of reach for most Kentuckians. Um, Kentucky needs to keep up with the rest of the country in terms of clean, green energy. What would you do to help protect and promote the use of clean energy? We need to incentivize alternative mm -hmm. energy, not penalize right. alternative right. energy. Uh, and, and that's where I see our government officials not representing us or the planet. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're representing big money. Yeah. And that's going to be old fuel industries. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, what I would like to do is, I mean, kids nowadays, for them, climate change is a reality. Right. They, they know it's not up for debate. They're mm -hmm. studying it. Mm -hmm. At my school right now, through a community partnership, things mm -hmm. I'm talking about before, we partnered with UofL on this, with Mary Bryden Miller, who's an action researcher, and with schools over the globe. Mm -hmm. And so what our school right now is doing as a middle school is they're studying climate change mm -hmm. in Kentucky and then in places like Norway. Mm -hmm. in Denmark mm -hmm. and other islands and these kids are sharing information with each mm -hmm. other they're building a global kind of society mm -hmm. and understanding on a deep level how climate change is affecting different areas at different times in different ways mm -hmm. That's cool. and you know, you know what they want to do then they want to become part of the solution right and and, and they want to work to to combat this issue and create alternative energy so uh, I'm, I'm going to advocate hard for our alternative energy industry sector mm -hmm. to grow. I, th I think hemp can be part of that, mm -hmm. solar can be part of that, geothermal can be part of that, mm -hmm. and we need to link our schools to those industries to develop those those next level uh, manufacturers, mm -hmm. those next level innovators, mm -hmm. and that's going to really invigorate not just our schools, but our economy and right. all of our research. Right. If they start studying this stuff when they're in middle school mm -hmm. and high school, mm -hmm when they're in college, when they're in grad school and beyond, mm -hmm. they're gonna be doing exponentially better. What also kind of relates to this, there's so much misinformation in our culture. Uh, one way, and we've got the internet. Right. You know, and, and with the internet, that's another great equalizer, uh -huh. right? Uh, internet needs to be a utility. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, you need it for business, you almost need it to function nowadays. Right. Uh, making internet a utility and making sure every single place in Kentucky has got access to fastest speed internet possible is going to prevent some of that misinformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As we can go look at the issues ourselves mm -hmm. instead of depending on what's coming at us from the TV. Right, right, great. Okay, so we're going to talk about guns because sure. this is a hot topic in our schools. Um, well, in, in, you know, everywhere, really. Um, should Kentucky have stricter gun ownership laws, and do you think that assault rifles should be banned? So I think we do need to talk about guns. Um, before I talk about any of this, I, I am a gun owner. Mm -hmm. I believe in the Second Amendment. My dad taught me how to shoot, uh, taught me safety protocol, all of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, that said, when I did buy a gun, I was able to get it in 15 minutes. Hmm. That's pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what I'm in favor for is we need waiting periods, mm -hmm. you know, at least 72 hour waiting periods. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get rid of bump stocks. Mm -hmm. We need, I, I have to, when I, all of us go get a car, we have to pass mm -hmm. some kind of test. It's a written right. test and it's a, a physical yes. driving mm -hmm. test. Mm -hmm. I would ask for both of those tests in order to buy a gun. Okay. That you need some kind of written test, mm -hmm. you need some kind of physical test, you need no gun safety. Right. Uh, we need some kind of laws to really encourage that your guns are stored safely mm -hmm. and out of the hands of children. We yes. know suicides go up dramatically with guns. Mm -hmm. uh, many suicides 
aren't effective the first time. Mm -hmm. People take medicine, too much medicine, too many pills, something, mm -hmm. uh, and they recover. Yeah. And they get that second chance mm -hmm. at life. With a gun to the head, there is no second chance. Right. So it'll save lots of lives that way. Mm -hmm. We need stricter background checks. Yep. We have to implement those. Uh, and the background check shouldn't be a one-time thing. Mm -hmm. Right, because right. you know things change in your life. There should be annual background mm -hmm, checks, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. and, and with this, I would, I don't want to come in as like dictator in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, my my whole platform is that we all need a seat at the table, right. and we all need to be able to talk about things and have the hard conversations. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we talk about things and we change our mind during the conversation, mm -hmm. and we learn together and we grow together. We make the common ground. This, but we have to admit. Uh, and studies have shown this, that the more gun regulation there is, the less gun violence there right, is. Right. That is not a disputable fact. That is research. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think we need to look at research and get rid of the talking points right, right. with that. Mm -hmm. um, people also often bring up Chicago right. a, a, as being like so torn by gun violence that's got strict gun laws. Mm -hmm. But that's an anomaly in the equation. Because around Chicago, or all these places, where it's really easy yes. to get guns. Yep. So they just cross over and come back. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at national data, go to Google search, does do gun regulations uh, create, uh, make, make, do, do, gun, do more regulations for guns cause less gun violence? Right. And you will find the answer to that yep. is yes, yep. it Absolutely. does. Right. What do you think about um, guns in schools, arming teachers? You yourself being a teacher, would you feel comfortable with that or or not? Well, that's a bad idea. <laughs> um, so what, what I'm in favor for, um, I, I feel very safe at my school. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that is I just love what I do, you know, and so when you're wrapped in, up in what you do, mm -hmm. uh, you do feel safe, you do feel freedom, there's an aliveness there. That said, there's some of my students right now when the announcements go on at a time of the day where they don't normally go on and it beeps, mm -hmm. some of them get panic attacks. Yeah. You know, but the, we're in a very hypersensitive environment right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, we do gun shooter drills. Right. And, and so this is becoming a reality that's affecting the mental and emotional health of our students and, and quite a few teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm a big believer in is our preventative measures. Mm -hmm. So. I'm gonna start off with a counter argument first. And there's many people who say, the guns aren't the problem. Yeah. The gun didn't pull the trigger, right. the person pulled the trigger. Mm -hmm. It's a human issue. Well, folks that say that, invest in education then. If it's a human issue, invest early on. Make sure our kids get the emotional, intellectual, social development they need so they're healthier and so that they're less likely to be prone to that violence. Right. We also have, on average in Kentucky, one mental and emotional health expert for every 1,200 kids. <laughs> in Oldham County, we've got one mental and emotion, emotional health expert for the entire district. Wow. So if you say it's a human problem, mm -hmm. then invest in our most important resource, which is each other, which is our people. The best way to do that is education early on and throughout. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So part of my measure would be that, that we need to invest heavily in education in our emotional uh, and, and uh, mental health experts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in a school right now where we've got an amazing security resource officer. Mm -hmm. uh, he is somebody who does keep our school safe. You know, he's, you know, he's, he's the shield there. Yeah. Uh, however, he is not just a shield. He is somebody who also builds bridges between students, mm -hmm. between teachers, between administrators. He's part of our culture. He plays basketball with our kids. Uh -huh. He jokes with us. He laughs with us. He's in the hallway. Uh, we'll take selfies with kids. Uh -huh. You know, and so as he's part of that culture, that's also de-escalating things. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. where it prevents fights. It prevents violence that might happen between students. Right. He also has his, his pulse more in the culture there. He's not mm -hmm. some separate thing. Mm -hmm. He's part of us. Part of so his job is to protect the school, protect mm -hmm. students, protect staff, mm -hmm. all of that. But his job is also, I'm part of this culture. Mm -hmm. I'm with you guys. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. And so we need more SROs. Mm -hmm. Not every school has one. Right. Um, and, and some people are, are scared of SROs. Uh, that they think that it will 
disproportionately hurt people of color mm -hmm. um, and disproportionately hurt people who are already on the margins or who feel victimized by police. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have an issue in our country right now where, I mean, just a few weeks ago, we mm -hmm. saw someone in his backyard, right. a young black man who got shot in his backyard yeah. for holding a cell phone. Right, right. So we, we need to have these hard conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know lots of police, they, they, are, they are good people, mm -hmm. but there's some police who've done the wrong thing and they haven't been penalized. Right. And, and that scares a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I can't emphasize enough how much our SROs need to be trained in de-escalation, mm -hmm. need to be trained in any kind of racial bias they may have, mm -hmm. that they're also educators there mm -hmm. and that should be a position of intense pride mm -hmm. you're not only you know you're protecting our future with our students you're protecting in my mind the most important institution that the commonwealth can offer which is education mm -hmm. but you're also part of that culture and that learning right. process and you're a positive role model for all those young people looking up at you and you've got an amazing chance to heal uh the divides within mm -hmm. a community that's mm -hmm. evident in our culture right now. Right, if we right. get our kids connecting in a positive way mm -hmm. with authority figures who are mm -hmm. positive, that's got massive ramifications right. for outside school walls. Yep, yep. We need to inspire our kids to want to be protectors, right, right. to be police officers, right. to be teachers. One way to do that is to show them yep. an amazing individual mm -hmm. whose job is to protect us and connect with us. Yep. That's great. Okay, great. So I think um, we're at the end of our questions. Okay. So if you want to take a few minutes now to talk to our audience again and just, sure. you know, um, tell them why they should vote for you. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a very passionate individual. Uh, I believe that our democracy is safer and more efficient if we're all involved. So I'm looking to get us all at the table. Yesterday I went to a town hall, and the town hall was on guns and school safety. Mm -hmm. It was inspired by March for Our Lives. Mm -hmm. uh, a congressman was invited to come. He didn't show up. I'll show up for everything. I will be there. Uh, I have a listen first approach. Uh, I, have, I believe I can learn my way through everything. I'm somebody who's really comfortable admitting when I don't know something. And I'll go to the experts, I'll go to the locals, I will read, I will do my research, I will come back. Uh, I believe right now more than anything, we need dedicated educators in office. And the reason being is we need data-driven, research-driven policy. We need people whose whole lives has been about connecting with the community. My job is to connect with kids, connect with their families, connect with my content, and help everybody to those next levels. That's what I want to do as a legislator. Uh, that said, I need people to help me with that and to fill in my gaps. So I'm going to be recruiting constantly health experts. Uh, we need more than just businessmen and lawyers in office. We need social workers, we need environmentalists, we need scientists, we need educators. The reason I think educators are so important right now is that we are community builders mm -hmm. and that we deal with every single demographic that's out there. We're service oriented uh, and we know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. Right. Yeah. So a as your senator, I'll have an open door policy, listen first approach. I'm always going to have the attitude that I can do more and I can do better. I'm open to criticism. I'm not threatened by it. Uh, I've had all kinds of papers marked up by all kinds of people, and I do that for a living right now. I am very, very comfortable offering my legislation, my bills that I would pass, and have those be critiqued. I think we're, we're stronger for that. The mm -hmm. more we share, the more honest we are. So I'm going to be looking for that. Uh, I, I don't want the word politician to be a dirty word, and it is right now. Uh, I think so many people are turned off by, by two things right now, but by the media because it's called fake news so often and I see journalism as being so important right now, and by politicians uh, because they get a negative rap, mm -hmm. that we need politicians who can take back uh, what it means to be a public servant and really connect with people. That's been my whole career, mm -hmm. it is to help folks to that next level. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to engage the populace, I want to be accessible, I want to ask people how they want their tax dollars spent. <laughs> so one of my tax pledges is this, 
is that for every single bill I pass that is going to raise any kind of taxes, or whenever I just spend tax dollars, period, or vote for a bill that does that, my question is going to be, how will this improve the quality of lives of individuals in our commonwealth in a measurable way over a measurable period of time? And that's going to be the standard I use. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be open to debate. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to sharpen our ideas with that. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And everybody out there, please go to our Facebook page or our YouTube page. These are recorded. Share them with your friends. And thanks again, Matt, for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate it.